Uh, we'll... Thank you, Allison, for that amazing prompt. We'll give it a couple more minutes. I already see two, our two amazing speakers are already on the call, but it's Monday morning. Let's slow things down a little bit. I know we're always super pumped and exciting for these calls, but I also wanna make sure we talk a little bit about that sustainability and how everybody's doing. Uh, does anybody else wanna share any, how they're feeling, how they're doing? You can use the chat. Joan, I saw you raise your hand. How are things? Hello, good morning. So what I did last weekend was uh, Operation Blankets of Love. Um, some of you may know who they are. Um, brought up um, a ton of supplies for Northern California, beds, toys, blankets, equipment, which um, because I'm from Los Angeles, I have a really good relationship with them. But one of the things that came out of it, he was not the owner uh, and operator, um, Brad, uh, was not aware of Haas. So I introduced him to Haas. He's very interested in getting involved. He's got um, supplies are not an issue, distribution is. So I let him know that I would put uh, Bobby or someone from Haas in contact with him. He's very interested in getting supplies to people on these calls and shelters um, and organizations on this call. Um, and he's just excited to get involved in some way. So I'll just throw that out there and then um, whoever you know, I can tell you every emergency we've had when paradise burned down um, Los Angeles, when they have big fires or emergencies, um, they're very quick to fill any orders. Um, it's very unusual time for him right now. Airlines, because of um, COVID and new COVID restrictions, they can't just hand you a blanket or the first class uh, beds anymore. All that stuff is being restructured. So the airlines have, you know, thousands of blankets to give away um, because they weren't sealed individually for COVID. So I would um, say that's someplace for outreach in other parts of the country. If you're near an airport, they're trying to get rid of that stuff and shelters always need it. So he, I have four um, tough sheds and a trailer, a convex full a connex full of stuff that he brought just for Northern California last week. Um, so anybody who's interested, you can contact Bobby or myself and Bobby, I'll put you in touch with him. He's really interested in figuring out how he can support Haas. So, so two things, Joan, one partnerships, partnerships, partnerships mm -hmm. Two, if he's got the supply, yep. these folks got the demand. Right. And yeah. so I think even better than that, I think it would be great. Maybe we'll have him come on a call and just talk yeah. about organization so we can learn yeah. more. I told him about the officer in Texas. I forgot his name, but I had it written down and I was going to send him his information. That's a one man band and he kind of does it all on his own. I'm like, he needs stuff. And he's, he was interested and willing to possibly, um, Austin is still, you know, from California is not too hot, awful. So he's willing to maybe do a run out to Austin and, um, you know, meet some people with Haas and, and get involved, but he's very interested in, in supporting everyone um, that's involved in this. I told him how animal welfare has changed because of COVID, it's actually better for us. We're supporting each other um, and that we're finding ways to do business differently. And he was I, all in. I love that. So, and then speaking of collaboration and bringing more people to call, we're gonna have a talk about that uh, from Maddie's in just a second when we open it up for national updates. But there was one other topic that I wanted to touch on that I think is just super exciting. I know Sarah Aguilar, I see Sarah on the call. And I know as we are going through trying time supporting our staff and the people that are doing the work is so critical for us to be not only successful, but to put really the human in human animal support services. So uh, Sarah, do you wanna touch a little bit on uh, some of the emotional support CPR training that you've been going through? Yeah, thanks, Bobby. Good morning, everyone. Um, happy Monday. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, so uh, I wasn't really familiar with uh, eCPR. Um, it's the same lines as, you know, regular CPR, but in the emotional support. And uh, we've taken, Rory and I are taking class, uh, learning how to facilitate and create space for people that are experiencing uh, some kind of emotional trauma or in crisis. And it feels very much right now like group therapy class. It's very heavy and good for my soul. And I'm so excited to get some, some tools uh, to be able to share with folks about it. Um, if you have an opportunity to look into it, there's a lot of information online, but um, it's just very much about how to connect your head and your heart with someone else's head and heart. 
um, and how to open those lines of communication beyond just just words and how to really uh, support people in a way that uh, has been really great to learn about. I love it, Sarah, and, and I'm so appreciative of that. Uh, we, with the Haas team, are also, also going through uh, facilitator training because we know even as times are changing, uh, there is still gonna be sort of a hybrid of us still hopefully having many more of these calls. And as you all are investing time with us, we wanna make sure that we're you know, honoring that investment. And one of the biggest things that we've been learning, uh, really grateful for Rory actually helping us with all of this facilitator training, uh, is just slowing down a little bit, meeting people where they are, meeting people at their pace, uh, you know, bringing the energy, uh, but also making space for folks that need a little bit of time to warm up that engine. So I am trying to practice what I'm learning uh, by slowing it down just a little bit. Uh, but I promise once these speakers get going, uh, my juices will be flowing once again, and I'll be super, super excited about the work. So one other thing that I wanted to share before we get to national updates is a very cool technology that was brought to my attention by Dr. Hurley and the team at Correct Shelter Medicine. So as these calls are continuing, we wanna make sure that we're providing value and making sure we're talking about topics that you're interested in. So this is a Klaxoon board. I'm gonna hope that the link that I shared with you actually works because this is very new technology to me as well. I'm gonna share my screen for just a second. Uh, you'll be able to sign in with just a nickname, hopefully. So you won't have to share your information if you don't want to. But all we're gonna ask is sometime through this call and future calls, uh, you just share some ideas of things that you might be interested in. So all you'll do is you'll press this X here or this plus sign here uh, with a circle around it and add an idea. So I'm just gonna say, how do we fund the new programs we are starting? And I'm just going to drop it as a sticky note. And the goal really is, is to figure out what excites you. Uh, and then we're going to line up speakers that can help talk about those topics in the future. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Um, while we're going through national updates, I hope you all can get logged into this. Uh, and as these things are coming to your mind, please put them on here. If we have time at the end of the call, we will do another screen share. Uh, to make sure that we can kind of see some of the ideas, uh, but ultimately we want this entire board to be full of ideas coming from all the folks that are investing time being with us. Um, so on that, I'm going to open it up for national updates. Hey guys, it's Bethany. I'll jump in real quick. Um, if you were on the Friday call, you guys heard this, but for those of you that weren't, um, Best Friends is super excited to share one of our new resources. We developed this in partnership with the IMLA, um, the International Municipal Lawyers Association, and it is a people, pets, and policies um, manual. It's got nine different chapters covering everything from telemedicine, um, integrating human and animal services, uh, breed specific laws. Um, it's a really great resource. It was, it was written for a lawyer <laughs> with kind of a, the lens of an attorney. So it's designed to support municipal and county attorneys that we know are very powerful decision makers in a lot of our communities. Um, I will drop the link in the chat. Actually, thank you, Allison, went ahead and did that for me. Um, so yeah, it's a great resource out there. Please share it far and wide um, and make sure that your local county or city attorney has a copy of it. Thanks, Bethany. And, and I'm uh, also super excited. Mark Peralta is going to be joining us next week to talk about the upcoming conference. So, um, so many amazing resources coming from Best Friends. So, and also uh, we will in the, in the next couple of weeks, going back to that traditional cadence of having additional interview hosts coming onto the call, which one, Bethany is one of. Uh, so super excited about that. Thank you, Bethany. This is Sharon from Maddie's Fund. Um, we you guys were also wonderful in um, responding to our questions about these calls and how they uh, affect you and, and help you do your work. And uh, we've heard how invaluable they are. So we really want to help get more people here. So we want you to invite a friend, a colleague, a partner, a community partner, a social worker, uh, anyone who you think can benefit from uh, these calls. Uh, so over the next two weeks, it's going to end on June 18th. Anyone you invite will be asked when they join the next call uh, to fill out a form, and both of you will be entered to win a $50 Amazon gift card uh, each, and uh, we'll be sending out a, another email reminder uh, this week. We did it on the Friday call, and now we're doing it on the, on the Monday call, so please, uh, you know, invite 
invite your colleagues, maybe someone else at a rescue or another shelter in your community that maybe doesn't know about these calls. That's it. Thank you, Sharon. Hey all, it's Kathy from Canada. For the Canadians on the call, I confirmed with Sharon last week that that applies to us too. And if it's $50 from Amazon, that means it's $50 US. Anyways, um, just an update as well. Please remember that the Future of Sheltering event put on by Humane Canada is coming up on June 17th. The registration fee is quite low. Um, thank you, Allison, for dropping the link in the chat and uh, hope to see many of you there. All right, well, I have one more plug uh, before we get to our speaker, and that is for the Friday leadership call. I know uh, many of you do join that call, uh, which is typically for directors in high level leadership and animal welfare. But we had Dr. Paula Tarenko on that call last week talking about Dr. William Key uh, telling historical information about animal welfare. Uh, Dr. William Key was a former slave Civil War veteran and self taught veterinarian that actually had an amazing relationship with what we used to call, or maybe they called uh, one of the smartest horses in the world. Uh, I think we should be able to drop that link into the chat. Uh, but what's even more exciting is that these conversations are all gonna be moving over to Maddie's forum. So we know that these calls typically end quick and fast, and there's so many ideas and thoughts going through your head. Uh, so Maddie's forum, uh, thanks to Maddie's, is going to allow us to continue those conversations after the fact. Uh, we're gonna be having our guest speakers in the future, uh, engaging with you, answering follow-up questions, and also the presentation and content will all be available in one place. So we're very excited about that in the future. Uh, looks like Allison just dropped the link uh, and I'm hoping actually to have uh, Dr. Tran uh, Tranko come on this call because uh, it's one thing to watch a recording, but it's another thing to hear about the history live and in action. So um, we're going to have many more presentations like that in the future. Uh, but speaking of presentations, one of the biggest, biggest, biggest questions we've had from folks uh, is about reintegration. As we are reopening and restarting sort of our new normal, uh, what are volunteers going to look like? What does volunteer culture look like? And how do we make sure if we have a fresh start at, at the relationship between staff and volunteers, how do we make sure that we set up folks for success? So I'm super excited that we have Kim Soto here, who is the Senior Director of Volunteer Engagement from San Diego Humane Society, to talk about the amazing work that they're doing in San Diego uh, with volunteer change management. So Kim, over to you. Hi, thank you so much. Thank you everybody for having me today. I'm really excited to talk about two of my favorite things, which are volunteer engagement and change, which sounds weird because nobody really likes change. But as we know, as animal welfare professionals, we've all been through so much change over the past few years that it's just something we've got to get used to. And it's something we've got to get good at. So I, let me see if I can share here. Okay, are you guys seeing my screen? Awesome. Yes. Thank you. So I've got a few minutes here today to talk about change. And what I wanna do is take you through kind of a classic change management model with an animal welfare and volunteer twist and give you some stories of things we've done to help kind of smooth the path when you need to make things different. And it can be extra challenging with volunteers because usually it's a large group of people all with varying skills, interests, motivations. It's a big ship to turn. So this is me, like I said, I'm Senior Director of Volunteer Engagement for San Diego Humane Society. I'm on my 13th year with San Diego Humane and I'm my 17th year working with volunteers. So in all that time, I have definitely had to help groups adapt to new ways and um, kind of re-emerging into post-COVID life is sort of just my next challenge, I think. So just to give you a little background on my programming, we see pre-COVID, of course, because numbers have changed so much, but we see about 4,000 volunteers in service every year working in this range of activities. So we have classic animal sheltering, we have wildlife rehab emergency, um, clerical and creative types, 
community-based uh, engagement volunteers, veterinary medicine, fosters, of course, and then events. So within the groups that we are trying to help adapt to new things, there's a, excuse me, a wide range of people and interests and connections to us. And this is just sort of my overview. Again, about 3,500 volunteers contributing 430,000 hours of service, lots of fosters. And the main reason for my map is just to talk about lots of locations. So when we're doing change management, we're also kind of doing it across the county. And in all these changes that we've had, um, you can see it's been a, a busy couple of years, the dates after those buildings are when they were open and when those volunteers came to us. So it's been a big couple of years, but let's talk about change. So what you're trying to do when you make a huge change, like bringing volunteers back, like changing procedures, like opening a new building, like taking a program away, which is a change that I have going on right now, you're starting people at the old status quo and you are trying to get them to a new status quo or a new normal as we keep saying. So in this graphic, I just want you to see that it's okay that it feels kind of bad in the middle. We're gonna start here. We're gonna dip down and go through some chaos. We're gonna do the work of integration and bringing people back up the hill and then end up in a better spot than we started. And for us, we try to go into that with this mindset to honor the space between no longer and not yet. So that space between where we used to be and where we're going needs our attention, it needs our celebration, and in some cases it needs our grief. And this is what my team, sort of our mantras every time we start a new change is that we understand not everyone is going to like the change we're bringing them to. We're prepared to engage in an uncomfortable process because we believe in what we're creating. That chaos period down in the pit <clears throat> will be chaotic, but it must be productive. We respect that each volunteer will move through the curve at their own pace. That is highly inconvenient. Why can't they just do it when we want them to do it, right? We have to respect everybody's change processes are gonna happen on their own pace. Our overall goal is to inform, communicate, and help people make their own decision about the change and ultimately their own decision about how they engage with us. And as a positive note, we know that if we do this well, if we respect the process, that most people will ultimately make that journey with us. We can get people to do it. We've done it before. So our, we try to work through communication, connection, and celebration anytime we have to make a change. So for communication, we always start when we have a big change on the horizon, we start with quiet conversations with key volunteers. You wanna look for your influencers, both positive and negative. You know your groups. Who is gonna love this and get excited and be your champion? Who is gonna drag behind and create a toxic mess? Those are the ones you wanna to talk to first. And we try to get out there. We get whatever staff has the best relationship, the most, you know, the longest term, the whatever um, connection people have to those volunteers. And we get this information to them early. Then once we're ready to announce the change, we try to do one initial chance to hear all the info. So like a big Zoom or back in the day, a big meeting with food, um, and then a quick follow-up in multiple platforms, knowing that not everybody's going to go on your Zoom or not everyone's going to come to your meeting. We then follow up with newsletter announcement, Facebook's using, Facebook using all of our communication channels. Um, we open up at this point feedback avenues. You have to get the information from the volunteers so that you know what they like, what they don't like, what they're afraid of, where the fear lies. So we do surveys, we set up time for office hours, we'll do small group coffee chats again back in the day but hopefully coming again soon where we would just say okay we're gonna sit out at our coffee cart at 9 a.m. everybody come that wants to talk about this. And in this, in this phase, we are looking to maximize communication. You can't talk about the change enough. 
we do a weekly transition bulletin throughout any type of change process. The volunteers know. We usually pick a day and say, okay, this is your Thursday bulletin, and we send an email out every week regardless of what's happening with the change. We share the goods, the bads. The main thing is so that they, you make it real. You make the change real by talking about it every week and maximizing communication. In that, we make sure that we're sharing both achievements and setbacks to the change. We celebrate any and all volunteer participation that we get. We write a lot of things as FAQs. Um, sometimes we just make them up. They weren't really frequently asked, but I think they should be frequently asked. And then we try to use a lot of visual scorecards, checklists, targets, things so that people know they are progressing through the change toward that new normal. You've got to paint the picture of where you're going and then help people see that they're making steps toward it. In connecting during the change, um, we have done lots of different things, but some successful ones I wanted to share are recruiting volunteers to be in any pilots, focus groups, studies, anything you have going on that's gathering research toward your new product new process, new change. You want to have volunteers involved in that and you want to be reporting back to the rest of the volunteers that you had volunteers in it. Um, we always seek diversity in participants. So we're looking for a range of service lengths, some new people, some 20 year people, some mid range people, all kinds of different demographics, of course, and also a diversity of risk acceptance and aversion. So if we have people participating, I want people that are afraid of the change and I want people that are down with the change. That way we can kind of compare where they're at and also paint the picture for everybody else in the group that's on either side of that spectrum. As you're creating anything new, I can't stress enough to make sure your staff and volunteer training is aligned. aligned. I learned this one the hard way uh, on a big change we did early in my career where I didn't think to stop and talk about you know, to the team that was making staff training and I made volunteer training and I made, they made it real different. And we ended up with staff and volunteers in two different places at the end of that normal. So all this work to just then have to do more change. So make sure your staff and your volunteers are being trained with intention, with alignment. And you've got to provide emotional support. Well, for staff and volunteers, change is hard, change is scary, especially right now. People are carrying extra emotional baggage and it's really hard to manifest enthusiasm for change. Um, like one of you said earlier, I don't like all these choices. I just wanna keep sitting home and binge watching, me too. So remember that in your whole big group of volunteers, you've got these people as well. So you've got to support each other and continue to paint the picture of this thing you're making, this process you're doing, this great change at the end of the dip. So also as you go, you have to celebrate what is happening. Because this is a big deal. If it's this big of a change that you're doing a whole model around it, this is a big deal. So we try to always remember to celebrate in a couple of directions. It's important to memorialize the past it's important to kind of end what used to be. Um, acknowledge that there can be grief in saying goodbye to the comfortable old ways. Like sometimes as staff, we get really excited about a new thing and we're in a national group and every, we're gonna go, go, go. And we forget that not everybody feels the same way. So allowing people to grieve what used to be, even if it wasn't the best thing, it's a, a real emotion. And, <laughs> Any, any memorializing you do, you make it brief. You don't wanna sit there in the old very long, make it meaningful and always make it a springboard to the new. For us, one time we had a campus that was closing and volunteers had worked there for a very long time. And for staff, we were so excited for it to close down because it had every kind of mechanical problem. It didn't have the greatest housing. We were like, yes, we're, this place is gone. And the volunteers were so sad because that had been their home for so long that we had a volunteer go and actually chip the tiles off of our old fountain and make little tiles to give out to the other volunteers. And, yeah, I could have stopped that and been like, that's weird, we're moving from there. But that's what they wanted to do to be able to move on. And so that's that bit of celebration. 
and always, always celebrate the new that you're moving toward. Tell the story of what you're trying to do. Tell the story of how you're getting there. Um, make sure to show the volunteer impact within your new systems. You do that with numbers, you do that with photos, you do that with stories. And I always like if I have a new thing we're moving toward to do the branding, do the swag, um, give, give your new thing kind of an in crowd vibe. Like, you know, our volunteers moving from another campus, we have to be like, no, no, this is the cool campus and here's your cool shirt or here's your cool pen or here's even just a cool branded header on your newsletter so that you know you're one of the cool kids and you're here with the new. And those little visuals do a lot more than you would think and they're usually pretty easy to pull off. So this, I know I'm painting kind of a rosy picture. So I just wanted to say that I know there are true detractors to any change when you determine that someone is truly not going to do your change, doesn't like it, doesn't agree with you, and you've done all these different steps, you've met them at every coffee chat, you've tried to memorialize the old, you've tried to celebrate the new, I hope you'll just accept that you're not going to change everyone's mind. And that the key thing to do with these folks is to maintain communication but don't focus, don't focus on that 5% that is gonna struggle or that's gonna truly be your detractors. Focus on your majority, focus on the people who are fearful but not hostile. Anyone who's hostile in the change, you wanna keep your enemies close, but you don't have to change your whole game because three people are gonna fight you on it. And with these detractors, it's key to set your rules of engagement with them. You're not going to accept 20 calls a day about their anger. You're not going to accept whatever disruption they're causing at a meeting. You're just not. So these are the things you negotiate with them separately to say, I understand you're upset. I want to keep hearing and I want to help you get through this change. But here's how we're going to play this game. You're gonna call me on Tuesday, like we're gonna have one call on Tuesday and I'm gonna hear everything about it. Or when we're in these meetings, I need you to ask questions in this way. Um, you don't need these few to derail your many. And these are in every change, they just start. So looking back at our change process dippity do here, I put, those key pieces in where I like to use them. So up there in the old status quo, when you know a change is about to happen, that's when your communication pieces start. Talk, 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 get it all out there, explain what you're gonna do. As things actually start to change and you start to dip down into that chaos period, that is when you're gonna keep the communication up and you're gonna start using those connection pieces. Uh, what volunteers do I know? What meetings can I have? How can I be available to help people with this change? And as you'll notice here, down in this chaos moment, there are people trying to climb back up toward the old. That's why I love this picture so much, because not everybody is moving smoothly toward the new. So when you kind of hit what feels like the bottom and it feels like chaos and there's just a lot coming at you. There's so much work to do. There's so much change to manage and so much emotion to manage. This is when you need a celebration piece. This is when you need to put a bow on the old or this is when you need to celebrate being a new group. In these moments is when they need your positivity and your ability to celebrate the most. And then as we start to swoop back up and integrate the new processes, people will start to come along. They will start to say things like, this isn't so bad. Or they'll start to say, oh, yes, I've, I've liked this all along. No, you haven't, but I'll pretend you did. That's fine, because we're up here in integration, right? This is where we need to be. So through integration, we keep communicating, we keep connecting, we talk to our laggards that are scared and not coming along so fast. We talk to our people that are way out front and are past us and are frustrated that it hasn't happened yet. Because you have a whole range of people changing, not changing. It's a lot to manage in these moments. And I, I absolutely get that. And that's why it feels so overwhelming. And then when you get to a place that feels like you've done it, 
we're at our new campus, we've opened our new program, we've closed down the program, we didn't want whatever your change is, keep going. Keep going with the communication, keep going with the connection, and keep going with studying that change. This is where more focus groups are good. This is where more surveys are good because when you get through the work of getting most of the group on the new side of the mountain, you know it's not perfect because it's new. So utilize those volunteers and utilize their input and interest to get the information you need to start perfecting once you're up on that other side of the mountain. So what does success look like? Because change is kind of forever in animal welfare, right? We just keep climbing mountains and doing things and luckily we just keep doing better and better things, but it's hard to sort of know when you're done. So for us, we know that we're at a successful change when whatever the innovation is has now taken root. It's part of the culture, the language is easy around it, the programs are working, the schedules are going. Uh, we know we have success when that feedback we got in the early days of the, the change in the resistance period, if we see that feedback apparent in the product we made, then we know we've brought people along properly and actually used the feedback that we gained. We know there was success if we've provided enough emotional support that people are feeling good, that people who didn't feel good are able to carry on with us. And ultimately, because some people don't decide to make the journey with you, we know that if people decide not to, they re if they remain supporters in another way, well, they're not going to volunteer for you anymore, but maybe they'll adopt or maybe they'll be a, you know, someone out in the community talking positively about you. They just don't want to do the new volunteer job. Then we know that we've been successful. Again, it will not be 100% of those detractors, but we try to keep as many of them as possible as supporters of our organization. And that's pretty much, let me stop here so I can see faces again. Okay. Sounds good. So that's kind of my overview of change, how we've got through it, um, the, the many different times and wrapped in all that is all the mistakes I've made and all the things I wish I hadn't done. So I'd be happy to take any questions or open it up, Bobby, however, however, whatever you want me to do next. <laughs> so the first thing that I would uh, tell you to do is check out that chat and look how much people loved your presentation. Oh my goodness. Thank you so oh. much for being here today. Um, I can start it off with a question from Susan about uh, visual school cards. She asked, what, what are they? And then okay. uh, other folks, if you want to keep dropping your questions in the chat, we will call on you. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. I don't look at chat at all when I'm speaking because I get distracted and I end up being like this. So thank you so much. I'll, I'll, um, Stacy, if you could caption those for me because I love to see them. Um, I work, my colleague Stacy Zeitlin is here so she could just do some screen, screen prints for me. I love it. Um, visual scorecards, that can be anything. So um, picture like the school fundraiser and you do the thermometer and you fill it up when you get you know, enough money to, at your bake sale. So you can do that, so, or a bullseye, or um, you know, a, a journey of a person walking and you're showing the person's now walking past our old campus and now we're on the street and now we're moving toward. So, and there's lots of like pre-printable, like downloadable things. You don't even have to be an artist to do this. I always just find some teacher websites are good and get them off the teacher websites. And it just it is a good visual tracker even if sometimes you have to move your progress back, it's okay. Because you're communicating, communicating, communicating. So people know why you went back and where you're trying to go. I love it, Kim. Um, looks like you checked so many boxes because everyone's just like, forget the questions, send us the deck. 10 out of 10, but I do have one more question for you okay. uh, before we wrap up. So, um, you know, I, I noticed all the different stages of support and investment into the culture change that you put, but obviously all of that also takes bandwidth. So, you know, the more that you're going to do to support that culture change, the more time, staff and resources it might take. So how do you decide uh, at what level of change do you invest what level of resources? Could you give an example of like a quick change versus like a, you should do all of these things change? Absolutely. I think I look at, I look at emotional investment of the volunteers and how hard is this going to be? 
Um, if it's like a quick change, like this leash instead of this leash, we'll do that process, but in a much abbreviated way. I'm not gonna send out a transition bulletin every week because I asked you to change a leash, yeah. but I will put that in, I will put a blurb in our bulletin about dog walking every time. And I will still like sell the benefits of that leash and I will explain and I will talk to the one who I know is gonna fight me on the leash. So I do it just scaled down. This thing all expanded is a big thing like um, merging with another organization or, you know, we're not gonna dog walk at 3 p.m. anymore. We're gonna do it at nine. Like these things that you know are just gonna be for the participants. That's when I use the, the full model, but any pieces of it work for any size of change. I love it, Kim, thank you so much. I know that there's many folks asking for the deck, but as Mary said, there's nothing better than watching an actual presentation. So if you are gonna ask uh, other folks in your organization to look at this, I would highly encourage you to share the link to the actual presentation, uh, which is gonna be available on Maddie's pet form. We're super excited to be moving all of our systems over there to make sure that we can continue the conversations. And even better, if a question does pop up later, we're gonna ask Kim to be joining us to help answer some of those questions. And you'll also be able to talk to other volunteer coordinators and directors to make sure that we're all moving along uh, in the same direction. So Kim, thank you so much. Stacy. I see you on the call. Thank you so much for setting us up. Uh, San Diego Humane Society is always being innovators and change leaders and always making sure that we're taking care of folks along the way. So we're super excited to have you on these calls. Uh, and before we move on to our next presentation, I know you folks are thinking something's missing today. And that's because the best freaking part hasn't freaking happened yet. So I'm gonna toss it over to Mary Smith for Mary's Motivation Monday and a couple extra announcements before we move over to our next presentation. Good morning, everybody. It's so great to see you, Kim. That was just an awesome, awesome presentation. Oh my God. I could listen to you for the rest of the day. So if you are feeling particularly stressed, I have to tell you, I read this article that said, Cortisol is produced when we're stressed and cortisol fucks with our brain. So if you're feeling fuzzy and foggy, there's a reason for that. So I have a solution to help de-stress you. Actually, it's not really my solution. It's a solution from the association because starting tomorrow, their spring conference starts and it's three days and it is absolutely filled with some of the most incredible information that will help us as we're trying to figure out what's the next right thing for us to do in animal welfare. The spring conference is all about inclusion and through their um, presenters, their workshops, their um, special events after the conference, their exhibit hall, it is literally three days that will blow your mind. And I hope you all can go and I want to just put in a plug for everyone that is continuing to do virtual conferences, because I'll tell you, at the heart of inclusion is making information like this available to as wide a group as you can. And that's what virtual conferences do for us. They make all of that available. And so I want to shout out to Best Friends, whose conference is coming up in, uh, let's see, June 23rd and 24th. And I also wanna thank uh, Cornell because their shelter medicine conference with the ASPCA will be July 9th to 11th. So seriously, take advantage of the fact that we still have these virtual opportunities to get as much information, as much food into our brains and into our hearts as we need. So with that, I'm out. I'm so glad to see everyone today. Kim, thank you again. I have just been so inspired by your presentation. Bobby, back to you. Thanks, Mary. And that, now you brought the energy right back up. So I slowed it down and you're just bringing it forward. So something else that has been a huge topic over, well, for a long time, but became very sexy and trendy during COVID is getting lost pets back home. Uh, and as we talk about return to home, uh, innovation and technology is really at the heart of it along the side of staff and volunteers that really care about honoring the human animal bond. So I'm super excited to have Tom Krimmer here um, that did some amazing work regarding the technology of getting uh, lost pets back home with the city of Dallas, uh, which has since been published. And he also has some very cool tools that he's gonna share for you to be able to use at your organization. So over to you, Tom. Hello. Uh everyone thank you for having me 
uh, it's going to be really hard to follow up after Kim's great presentation and um, Mary's ceiling, which now I'm kind of envious that my walls are just white and empty. Um, but I'll try my best. Um, so hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, I am today, I think I'm going to mostly show parts of the, the tool that I was working on for the last few months as a part of my thesis project with my university, um, which I just finished. So um, that's that has been a really nice process. And I was um, I was also here a few months back to share some of it. Um, so for those of you who have seen it uh, and things will look familiar, then you'll have um, maybe some new thoughts. Um, and for others, I hope uh, this is interesting as well. Um, and really what this is, um, is a tool that was built out of a, project, a shared project that I started with the, the Dallas Animal Services. Um, and the starting point was really just me trying to, so I studied data science and philosophy. Um, and for my last year's uh, sort of thesis project, I really wanted to do something data related, but that also takes and like have space for communities and, and spaces that are relatively underrepresented in the data science sphere that are not you know the, the first thing that you think about when you think of data science um and uh, we can maybe talk about it later how somehow i got to animal sheltering um and really what i, I wanted to do was to take the data and if, that i was amazed to see how rich and granular it was um, and to just be able to show it and put it in a new way um, that would eliminate some of the shelter's goal and support its mission and uh, its, its programs and policies. Um, and through conversation, I had some ideas by myself on what you know what things could be interesting, but the return to home um, sec portion came up um, frequently, and this was like an area that we wanted to um, to investigate. And the other sort of second facet is the geographical aspect, like. They were keep asking, like, we want to see, you know, where are dogs coming from and where are, where they're going. And seeing this data on, on a map just changes a lot from, uh, I think, from Excel and, you know, spreadsheets. Um, so I built this tool that was focused around visualizing uh, different facets of, of stray intake and, uh, and return to home uh, data. But then as time went on and we had more conversations, we have added some more sections to it. So um, I'm going to do a quick overview uh, of the tool and how it looks like now. Um, and uh, and then sort of the new, uh, the last thing I'll show is a new, the, the newest thing we added is the, the census data. So like the human demographic information. So not just like looking at the shelters data, but also looking at the human demographic data for this community and seeing how those two things work together. Um, and as I'm walking through this, like, please, uh, you know, feel free either uh, in the chat or to you know think about it later. But really what I want this to be is for a tool that will serve um, and everyone. So if uh, whether it's and, and, and a big part of what I was doing in the last few months is to transform it from a tool that was built for Dallas and for their data to something that I could like essentially take another CSV file with another shelter's data that looks fairly similar and just plug it in there and have the same thing um, apply. So um, think about whether what you see is something that you want to see with your shelter's data or maybe it's something that you've seen and it's kind of the same but oh if only you had put this aspect or like maybe I've shown it in this way, then it will also be great. And also maybe if like this is kind of unclear or confusing or like, wait, well, this is kind of hard to imagine. I would really want to use it if it had this and this, like everything, every thought of that sort would be useful. Um, so let me share my screen uh, so I can open the tool. Uh, um, there we go. Um, this is a fancy loaded screen. Um, oh, it was open before, but then I forgot that it's idle, so I, it went out again. But now you can see it live, what happens when you enter. Um, and this is, uh, in the beginning, if you tried yourself, there will be sort of like a login page and it will ask you for credentials, but you can use it. Um, I'll put it in the chat and everyone can access this. Uh, the, the folks at Dallas were very happy to share this with everyone. Um, was interested. So this is kind of a welcome page and just explains what the different pages are. So you don't need me if you want to just explore it on your own time uh, and pace um, and sort of like big, big boxes that de describe what data is uh, here. Uh, there's also a date range thing. So right now you can see what uh, ranges of data of intakes um, uh, 
uh, went into this tool, but you can play around with it if you want to see the data for only a specific period of time. Um, and I'll also say that also, right now this is focused on stray um, and RT and return home dogs. Um, and I'm kind of I'm currently working on on applying this to cats as well, but, which have some you know the different characteristics on on how a return to maybe not home but you know location of found location looks like. Uh, but right now what I'm saying uh, applies to dogs. Um, so the first tab here is kind of like an overview before diving into the um, the RTO piece, uh, which just shows the the trends of intakes and outcomes um, across the time range that the um, that the the, the, yeah, the tool currently describes, um, and just gives an overview of you know the intake types and the outcome types. Um, and this is sensitive to the date ranges. So if you want to see only for a particular month, you can look at a month. Um, and uh, and this will change automatically. Um, the focus uh, really starts here on the strays and um, and return to owners. So uh, and right here I, I call it RTO because this was the sort of the standard term, but I also prefer the uh, you know, not the use owner but use uh, maybe home or family or whatever you want to call it. But for not maybe for convenience I'll be saying RTO. Um, so. The, the map here at the bottom shows uh, basically for each uh, census tract in Dallas, the number of strays that were found in the census. Um, and this is this layer. And if you change to the second layer, you can see the RTO rate um, at this particular census tract. And the reason I'm using census tract at the beginning, it was with zip codes, which was what the, the shelter used uh, in the beginning. Um, but this make, gives a fairly wide um, and not very, very fine image. Um, and also the use of census tracts allows the, the correlation with the census data, which we'll see uh, in the in the last tab here that's called demographic data. Um, so you can see basically where um, stray dogs are coming from. Um, and you can also see here on the right, if you want to see a particular one, um, how many strays are there and, um, and what's the RTO right? And you can see the trend of, for example, whether um, areas that have more stray intake, or what's their RTO rate like? Is it higher? Is it lower? Um, and this will change between shelters. Um, so this is this page. And if you also want to maybe look only at here, they call it like a sort of field RTO or, an, or a dog that has gone to the shelter and then returned to owners. So you can also look only at these specific ones and not all of them, um, as well as filter by different types of uh, intake. Um, so this is sort of one aspect of this data, of the data in the tool. The second thing uh, that we looked at is the distance traveled by dogs. So we are really interested in um, saying, okay, we have all these RTOs, so we know where they were found and we know where they got back to. Um, so we can ba basically take these two locations, find the distance between them of like, as if a dog was walking and understand if a dog is found somewhere, how far is it from home? Like, like how far has it gone? Um, and does that change in different uh, places around the city? Um, so this histogram shows this, this, this piece of information, the distance traveled, for dogs that we know what their found location was and the um, and the and the owner's location, um, and uh, which shows that like, dramatically most dogs were found very close to home. And this is after filtering ones that had kind of like faulty data or questionable information, or ones that had like the exact same found and um, uh, and and owner's uh, location, which someone sometimes it's input the same and it, then it's zero. But even after cleaning these zeros, these complete zeros. Um, dogs really rarely travel um, very far from home, so that was a, an interesting insight. And then uh, this one shows uh, the same piece of information, but grouped again by uh, where the dogs were found. So whether there are certain areas in the city where dogs are found, that it's more likely that they've, they've traveled further away from home. Um, so this is what this page is kind of getting. At. And, and I hope it, I hope this is kind of clear. And again, there's a lot here, um, but uh, you can also explore this at your leisure afterwards. Um, so this tab looks at length of stay, um, and here we diverge a little bit from just the RTO piece just to have a, a reference um, for different outcomes. So basically, if we have an RTO or we have uh, adoption outcomes or transfer, um, how long do dogs stay at the shelter? Um, and again, uh, this map tried to, to try to get it whether this length of stay changes uh, based on the owner's location. So RTO where where the RTOs um, from owners in different parts of the city, like um, took similar time or different times. So maybe in one one hypothesis we had is maybe in uh, locations that are further away from the shelter, it will take longer for dog owners to come. And, and this figure is kind of encouraging by showing that in Dallas, this is really not the case. It's very, it's very similar and uniform um, across uh, the city, which was very encouraging. And again, in other shelters that I've, I've uploaded the, the, their data to, um, this can look very different. Um, so this is like the, the length of stay category. Um, here we have a, 
sort of a kind of an exploratory um, euthanasia page where uh, first of all just shows a map with where where the requests come from and whether they are um, owner um, owner surrenders and owner requests or um, euthanasias that happen to stray dogs um, and where they came from uh, and here we can break down all the the different cases between different uh, different variables that the shelter keeps track of so the age group for example um, or the condition um, uh, that was identified at intake um, and uh, that this uh, this basically can change based on whatever the shelter's preference. I just put some things here and we're kind of playing with it. Um, and the last piece I wanted to show is the is the demographic uh, piece, which is why the um, the data is also organized by census tracts. Um, so here on the left, this is just the demographic data, and it shows the different layers that exist here, so that you can look at. Um, which um, I've put here based on um, Dallas's interest. Um, and uh, actually this interest, the, the, at first I put some of these, but for one example of how or like why would you use it or how some surprising ones were relevant um, was that they were designing a campaign um, that was uh, uh, targeted at improving their RTO rates and they were having their focus areas chosen partly by the, the figures that I was showing uh, in the previous tabs. Um, but a lot of the communication um, they wanted to, they, I, I only originally had this foreign born piece um, but they really wanted to design the communication in, in a way that in, in different areas in ways that matches the languages spoken in these areas. So I added these like Spanish and Vietnamese and Chinese speaking um, layers, which is basically the sort of the answers to the census questions about um, what the percentage of, um, that lives in this area and speaks this language, but does not speak English very well. Um, so you can kind of see that and then they tailored their communications accordingly. Um, so this is uh, sort of one example, but uh, Obviously, there can be many. Um, and the second piece here is um, allows to look at uh, both a demographic variable uh, that you can choose, like median household income for, for each census tract, um, and a shelter level data. So for example, stray intake. So you can see that, for example, here that the trend that um, areas that have higher median household income um, also tend to have lower stray intakes, um, for example. And you can play around with it and with all uh, with all the different shelter level data that exists in the previous uh, parts. Um, so that's it. I think I'll stop here. Uh, let me stop the share. Uh, this is how it looks like now, uh, but this is really uh, you know open for uh, modifications. And uh, yeah, and I, I I would really love to hear. Yeah, Tom, I'm sure the questions are going to come rolling through because it's such eye opening information. But but even before we get into the conversation about your tool, which is amazing. I want to give the biggest shout out to Dallas Animal Services, Melissa Weber and the team for just openly and transparently sharing their information, right? Oftentimes, this is one of the biggest municipalities in the country. And they are so willing to just allow Tom to come on this call with hundreds of other shelters and just tell their story. And I think that just shows that with the trust that's being built in our community, uh, the more that we can share transparently, the stronger we're going to be and the closer we're going to get to our goal. But off my soapbox, now over to you, Tom. Uh, there is a question about, um, Sarah has a question about how they can access their census tracking data in their community, but maybe you can even take that as a conversation about if a shelter wants to use your tool, what are the steps right. to get started? Right, uh, yeah, uh, thank you, that's a great question. So um, right now what happens is this is not fully automatic. So the way this works is that um, that sends me a, a CSV file, basically a dump from their information system that, for example, has all the dogs that went through the shelter in a given year. Um, and then I take this CSV file and I do a little bit of pre-processing. And, and part of this pre-processing is fetching um, the census data for the, the areas, the, the zip codes that I identify uh, the, in the locations in the, in, the, uh, in the data. So I do it manually, um, but this takes I don't know, like a Few hours of work it's it's really not intense um and uh there's so a little bit more pre-processing that happens in the background is this calculating the distances traveled between them is also something that right now i it's it's not online existing in the tool i need to get the data and then i run the code and it takes i don't know an hour maybe um overall so the, the process really is like sending me an email we figure out what the data needs to look like i uh you send me a csv file and it takes maybe a, a few hours um of work and then I can load it into the tool um, so you can see your data there. Um, and in, in, in theory, there, there could be ways to automate some parts of, um, of this process, but you know, so far I, I haven't. Um, but right now it's like a, an extra, maybe a day or two buffer uh, of work, um, but not too much. I, I'm, I'm really happy to do that. Uh, so that's, that's how it looks like. Carly, does that answer your question or were there a couple components that you wanted to 
ask about. Can y'all hear me? I guess, um, perfect, thank you. Well, first of all, I think this is really cool. And I know that there's like data people out there. Like it gets me so excited to know that there are people like from all aspects coming in together to help animals. Um, I guess my main question is, or one of my main questions is like, so you mentioned that the Dallas Animal Society has to give you like the data, like they have to email it to you. Um, why, like, does that mean that the data is not available by like county? Like you can't just pull that data from government websites. Like that's not available for you to already pull. And if so, um, why is it not? <laughs> right. Um, so yeah, it, it kind of depends. In their case, uh, their data was available online. Um, there was one, uh, or I guess there was, there were two, um, fields that were not in the online one that were in the that they could pull out manually and, and send it to me and okay. once we were already in conversation uh it was it was just kind of easier to do that through them um but in, in, in principle yes some yeah some shelters that have their data online and, and given that they have the relevant fields which are really not a lot it's mostly like the, the location based ones and kind of like an intake outcome um, categorization uh -huh. and yeah in principle it it, it it can be possible that i do it without them manually sending it to me Okay. Wow. That's super interesting. Yeah. I hope, um, I hope it really takes off. This is a great idea. And I hope we can all like get our local shelter data, data, shelter data together and send it your way. And, uh, cause it seems like a really great tool. Thank you for like contributing and sharing with us. Thank yeah. you. That does answer yeah. my question. Thank you. Thank you yeah. So thanks Carly. And speaking of just sharing information, uh, Dallas did also uh, launch a new website recently, be Dallas 90. Uh, they have some of the most amazing dashboards that I've ever seen that are showing very active shelter data. So the community can see where they are day to day. Um, so it's definitely a model for a lot of other agencies. And, and also with uh, this having a lot of manual uh, requirement from Tom, uh, I'm sure that list is going to get pretty long of agencies. I know uh, Tom is working very closely with our Haas pilot shelters, and we're hoping to be able to tell a, a bigger story through even just the 39 pilot communities that we have. Uh, Tom, what do you think that your future goals are of this tool? And, and what are you hoping to be able to uh, see from all of this data? Um, yeah, I think right now it's... Um, it's really about understanding. Or so, as I said, there there could be a lot of ways that I could um, make this the, or let the process kind of more smooth in integrating this with um, more with with shelters data for something like maybe manually. Um, so being able to pull the data without them going through the stage, um, synchronizing it with their like most many shelters use the same information system like Chameleon. Theoretically, I could figure out the way that this could sync with the information system and not require you know a, a manual dump of a CSV file um, into this. Um, and and there could be you know all all types of pages that I could add. There's all there's many facets that in the data that we didn't touch on. There's one that um, so there's a page that I didn't add so far, but we had a um, a whole page dedicated to like microchip analysis because they have a field tracking whether an intake dog had a it, what, like the result of a microchip scan or the dog. So we were like, okay, let's see our microchips. Um, are dogs, you know, found in different areas? Is the microchip are the microchips prevalent um, in the same way throughout the city? And what does the RTO rates look like when there is a microchip versus when there isn't a microchip? So there's like, you know, th this can continue to grow in different ways. Um, really, what I want to understand is how what do people want to use and how so that they would actually use it. And if people are, that, that what's got me motivated and working throughout this process is that if people were like, okay. Like we really want to use this tool and maybe it needs like X, Y, and Z, then I would do the X, Y, and Z because I know that someone out there will use it and that's what it's for. Um, so yeah, it, it's just about finding that the demand and the, you know, and then finding out the resources and like the capacity to do it. But so far it's, you know, it's what yeah. And, and Tom, the thing I appreciate about you the most is you really are coming into this as a developer, scientist, and researcher where you didn't have, you didn't have a goal of finding an outcome. You wanted to look at the data and figure out what the data taught us. And so uh, I think it's really exciting to see if there's one thing, obviously there's nothing better than looking at your own community's information, but is there something that you know that um, DAS changed reg regarding their return to home once they saw your data or the data that you shared? Um, yeah, so one, one big thing was the, the, the distance traveled piece. And there we, we saw that basically 70% of all dogs traveled like up to a mile from home and 40% and traveled up to a, basically a block, like 40, 400 feet. Area for mom, which is a lot, um, and we've just again they had an intuition that this was the case, um, but it really helped to just have the data demonstrated, and this supported a number of different sort of like local programs for what it looks like when a dog is found, um, so that people are encouraged both to use like 
different local resources and they started using um, uh, another app. Uh, well, I forgot the name now. Next door. Next, yes, this okay. next door. Um, and, and, and instruct their field officers in a way that would maximize the chances of, uh, again, of, of these dogs being like found close to home, especially in the areas that you can see on the map that it's even more likely that they are so close to home um, to avoid the, the you know, dogs that are potentially being able to be found there from getting all the way to the shelter and then going through this whole period and like all this process where um, they could really be just like around their neighborhood and investing like an extra 30 minutes even um, in, in, in maximizing on that could change a lot. Yeah, Peter Wolf wasn't wrong when he said, you know, half these dogs are literally being found in their front yard and, and there's so many things we can do to get them home. Uh, thank you so much, Kim, Tom, uh, for all these amazing presentations today. Uh, reminder, we are going to continue these conversations over at Maddie's forum. So I'm sure Allison will drop that link in the chat. And to close it off, I'm going to toss it over to Mary Smith. Hey everyone, I definitely feel like my brain is full in a really good way. Thanks to Tom. Thanks to Kim. Really you guys have set the tone for this week that will only be um, made even better through the association's conference. So please, you guys try to check it out this week. You don't want to miss it. Thanks, everybody.